We welcome you to the Lord's house this day. As we prepare for worship, let us turn to hymn 196 in our hymnals. We'll remain seated for this hymn, 196. It is good that we are gathered here this day. It is uh, pleasing to look upon your faces and uh, to see the love of our God radiated from you and to know that we are here all for the same purpose because we know that we need our Lord and Savior. We know that we need him as part of our lives. We know that we need his strength. We know that we need his peace. We know that we need his forgiveness. We know that uh, he is our constant companion. And he is the one that leads us through life's road. And so we come together because we know that the covenant that we've made in the waters of baptism, that is the path. And he meets us. He meets us there in that path. And as we need strength, and as we need a reminder of uh, that walk that we do every day, we come together. 
I'd like to read uh, from the book of Alma, from the fifth chapter. For behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the Son of God cometh upon the face of the earth. And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. And he shall go forth, suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. And this, that the word might be fulfilled, which saith, he will take upon him the pains and sickness of his people. And he will take upon him death, that he may, lo he may loose the bands of death, which bind his people. And he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy, according to the flesh, that he may know, according to the flesh, how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Now the Spirit knoweth all things. Nevertheless, the Son of God suffereth according to the flesh, that he might take their, upon him the sins of his people, that he might blot out their transgressions according to the power of his deliverance. And now behold, this is the testimony which is in me. This passage reminds us that our Lord God, the maker of the heavens, suffered for you and for me. And as our Lord God has suffered and died on the cross for you and I, so he knows how to treat his people how to succor his people, and how to aid his people. The cross represents triumph. And we know that our Lord God has taken and transformed defeat and turned it into victory. Our Lord God has transformed death and turned it into life. And our Lord God takes trials and struggles and turns them into opportunities to show his love. And so we come and have every reason to rejoice in our Heavenly Father as we consider this feast, this remembrance, which is symbol of his love for you. We will continue to worship with hymn number 194, and we will stand for that. <clears throat> Father, his son, 
the praises of Jesus the angels proclaim, fall down on their faces and worship the Lamb. Then let us adore and give up his right, all glory and power and wisdom and might, all honor and blessing with angels above, and thanks ever ceasing and infinite love. Our Lord and Father, you who dwell up on high, you who love us without bounds, you who we uh, have come to worship this day, we have entered your sanctuary looking forward, Lord, to the ability to reach forth our hand to partake in remembrance of that which you have given unto us. Lord, we recognize this as a very personal service, a service for each one of us individually, one where we can reflect on our own life and then remember that life that we are called to, that life that we are to share with others, to be there for them. Lord, there are so many in this congregation that are hurting right now for so many different reasons. There are so many who have a desire to be here but cannot. Lord, we would ask specifically for each one of them with that desire on their heart that you might bless them that you might touch them and send your healing spirit to be with them. Lord, what an honor and a privilege it is for each one of us to gather this day in your name. And I pray all of these things knowing that you love us without bounds. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Before the preparation of albums, I would like to share a scripture setting with you. And uh, as I was considering the sacrament today, I was directed uh, to a couple of settings in the scriptures. The first one being uh, from the book of Luke. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled, which is written in the prophets concerning me. Then I will partake with you in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide amongst yourselves. For I say unto you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And from the book of Revelation, and I heard, as it were, the voice of the great multitude and the voice of the many waters as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. 
Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. When we look at the Old Testament, we see that the Hebrews went through many trials, went through many events, and after those events, the Lord asked them to remember those events, to memorialize those events as a remembrance of his faithfulness to them in those times. But what they may not have realized was that those events not only looked forward, not not only looked past to what God had done for them, but were also promises for what he intended to do for them in the future. We can look at this uh, sacrament of the Lord's Supper and we see that which our Lord has already done for us. It represents his trials and his temptations and his struggles and his death and his resurrection and his triumph. But it also is a promise of the future, the promise of eternal life, the promise of his kingdom. And so as it speaks of in Revelation, when the saints come before him washed clean and white, clothed in fine white linen. That is what we seek to be. So as we partake of the sacrament this day, let us remember, we not only remember an event, we remember a promise. We remember a promise, the earnest of salvation that our Lord and Savior offers to you and to me. As we prepare for the sacrament, we will sing hymn 263. After the singing of this hymn, we'll take just a moment to pause for you to have silent prayer, and then the priesthood will serve that sacrament. 263.
At this time, I invite you to uh, share with me in kneeling toward the altar, the blessing of the bread is given. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask through the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and to witness unto thee, O oh God, the Eternal Father, that they are to willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him and keep his commandments, which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen.
Once again, shall we kneel? O God, the eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen.
Good morning. Jesus caused his disciple John to write these words. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. That we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. It's easy words, is it not? It's easy words, is it? Love each other. That's what he said to do. It's hard words when you consider who wrote this. You see, at this point in time, in John's epistles, it was probably 90-ish years A.D. since Jesus was born. He's, he gave up everything he had to follow this barefoot Messiah. He not only watched the brutal crucifixion of that Messiah just a few years later, every one of his friends in the ministry had suffered death in the same or even worse manner at this point in time. Jerusalem, his hometown, had been decimated for the last time. Not one stone left upon another. His own house, his belongings, everything gone. In his own life, after now seeing apostate already rampant in this newly growing church, his own life was lived in exile. He had seen the worst of the worst of the worst, day in and day out, and he says... This is the solution. Love each other. Love each other. It's good words for us on this day. If your work week uh, went like ours, it uh, seemed like a chapter out of the life of Job for our congregation. Uh, from the north and south and east and west, you know, at first we heard of a loved one who was taken uh, quickly and suddenly without warning left three sons. Uh, and then we heard of another family who's lost everything. And yet, more friends passing away and other friends ill. And, and the needs go on. And I look at every row in this congregation and I think if you just touch someone to the left or the right, you're going to find someone who's been affected and is suffering right now. Um, but yet there's hope because we love one another. I went to a memorial service with my wife yesterday in Lamoni and uh, expected to find, you know, these, these three young men I mentioned, uh, it was just a few years ago, their mother was taken and, and now, uh, they're, and they were in high school and now these young men just lost their father and I expected to find them as anyone, broken and hurting. And yet they said, if you want to remember us, if you want to help us, remember the Lord God who brought us together. Proclaim his name. And if you want to remember us, remember the church that he restored because that's what brought our family together. He said, Pro proclaim the works that the Lord is doing if you want to help us. Only the Spirit of God can bring us to feel that because what John wrote, and it sounds almost callous in light of all the suffering going on in our midst, but if, if we understand where he comes from, if we understand what the Lord is doing, and if we understand what the Lord has done, he ultimately, John is saying, whatever happens to me and whatever has happened doesn't matter because we know who owns us. There's another man in scripture besides Job. He was sent on a mission. Uh, a man's name is Jonah. And Jonah's story is interesting for a couple reasons. One is of all the books of prophecy, you know, all the books written by prophets written in the Bible, it seems that Jonah's is unique in this account. The rest of the prophets, their books are all about the message they were supposed to deliver to the people and what the words God had spoken that they were now to repeat for their hearing were, were all about. And yet, in Jonah's story, we get none of that. The whole story seems to be about Jonah 
in what he did or didn't do. Um, how would you feel and if, uh, if you, I was going to pick a couple people out, but I won't pick on anyone. But how would you feel if you're swimming along and a big old fish is right behind you about to swallow you up? It might feel a little scary, right? right? Or how would you feel if, you know, you really, really wanted something uh, to bring some relief to your life and it comes and it happens. You'd, you'd feel kind of happy, right? And then how would you feel if that thing that you had hoped for was suddenly taken from you? Well, you'd feel a little sad, right? And how would you feel then if trials that you had never even anticipated were on you in a way that you just didn't want to live? You'd feel awful, right? Well, in the story of Jonah, we're told the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and nights. Now, it's interesting because the Lord, it's the scriptures say the Lord prepared that. And what's uh, fascinating in the reading of these other challenges is that after his time in Nineveh, this prophet is in the desert and it's hot and it says the Lord prepared a gourd and this gourd pr- sprouts up miraculously and provides shade for him in the desert and he's, he's relieved, he's happy. And then this same Lord says the Lord prepared a worm when Jonah wasn't quite uh, in the attitude he should be. The worm destroys the gourd, the vine wilts, and he's left in the heat. And then it says, the Lord prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished himself to die. It was so bad. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. Now, in each of those verses, the Lord says, or the word says, the Lord prepared. The Lord prepared the fish. The Lord prepared the gourd. The Lord prepared the worm. The Lord prepared the wind. And if you open the Hebrew meaning of that word prepare, you know what that word prepare means? It actually means to appoint. See, the Lord not only prepared it, he appointed. He appointed the fish. He ordained the fish. That caused his fear, probably. It would have caused mine. But he ordained the gourd that provided the comfort. He ordains our comfort. He prepared the worm that removed the comfort, and he ordained, he appointed the wind that caused his pain. Why? Because he is the Lord. After all of Job's calamities, he falls to his knees and he says, I came naked into this life. I'm leaving naked in this life. It doesn't matter what I have. Blessed be the name of God. Or in the Hebrew, he would have said, Baruch Atah Adonai. Blessings to you, O God. Blessings to you, O God. And I share that, the Hebrew words, not that I speak any Hebrew, but they're going to take some meaning later. Those are the words of praise that, despite losing everything, that the word from God asks us to speak back to him, and and we'll share that. So the Lord appointed these things for Jonah. It didn't just happen. It just wasn't random. And what I found fascinating in my study, and this wasn't anything I was expecting because I just wanted to read about Jonah. As I studied that word appoint, do you realize something? This was fascinating to me. There's two scriptures. You, You know them. He, he telleth the number of the stars and he calls them by their names. And this one, teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. The number of the stars and to number our days, that word number and that word prepare, both are the same word in Hebrew, which means to appoint. So when he says he numbered the stars, he appointed every star. They weren't just random dust. That, oh, well, maybe a million, maybe two. No, every single one had a specific purpose. But even more so when he says to us, teach us to number our days. He's saying, appoint each day of your life. Determine that you will live it with purpose. That you won't while it away with mindless activities, he says, don't let your days determine your life. Don't let the calamities, don't let the sufferings, don't let the pain. 
He says, because you can't know what the Lord has appointed. He said, don't let the, your days determine your life, but let your life determine your days. Let the purpose for which you have been made, the life which he has given you, reflect your journey in him every day of your life. You see, you must appoint your days, no matter what happens. For all the things that are happening to us, we are not victims. We are victors. Because of him. Because of him. The communion is the representation of the ultimate victory. God prepared our days before we existed and before they existed. The only thing we can do, the only thing we can do is pray for our days to come that we will number them or rather appoint them to walk and work for him in them no matter what happens. That's all we can do. That's all we can do. He purposed them so if we're a child of his, we we do likewise. And ultimately... um, Those days become a vessel to bring blessing, to bring life, to bring love, to love one another, like John said, despite what happens, despite what happens. If you were a young girl living in Jerusalem about the time of uh, these days and an angel comes to you and says, by the way, uh, God's got great plans for you. You're going to bear the Messiah. Wow, wow, wow. See, God appointed a lamb. Abraham said, my, God, my son, God himself shall provide a lamb for a burnt offering. It was planned from the beginning. and It was planned this young girl would bear this child. But do you know what God had appointed for her? You know, as soon as she heard that news, she probably had that room painted blue, right? Right, she was ready. Um, In the days of Herod, the people were called to return to their homeland to pay tax. And so that was uh, happening at the time when when, uh, Mary was with child. And um, they headed back to the hometown of Bethlehem. And, you know, This is something I learned just recently. People in my class know this or may remember from from a recent session, but um, sheep were a common thing in the the days of Israel and still are now. Um, I owned some sheep once, once. (laughs) And uh, sheep are an interesting animal. And sheep, because of their nature, uh, they didn't want them roaming through the cities. They, They wanted them on the outskirts. But there was a special place dedicated to raise the sheep that will be offered for the sacrifice, for the daily sacrifice and for the, uh, the Passover. And uh, this place, you know where it was? The town where these sheep, for the sacrificial sheep were, were raised, was Bethlehem. That's what its purpose was. It's where they kept these sheep, and that's where the shepherds raised them. And it wasn't by chance that Mary was called to return there. Now, as the story of Luke says, shepherds were abiding their fields by night. And you know what? In that day and even now, the shepherds don't hang out with their sheep all night. They gather them in to a, to a special place and, and they put them in a fenced area and the shepherd would guard that entrance, the gap, with his own body. But, but in this time, the sheep were bearing lambs. And, and sheep are kind of like deer. You know, if you follow deer in the woods, you know that they kind of become uh, fertile in the fall and in the springtime, the, the deer are born. And it's really only that time of the year. It's not like, uh, you know, humans, I guess, or fish, whatever, kind of have, uh, you know, animals or birth, offspring, uh, different times. It's governed by a, a biological clock, I suppose. And so... When Mary is returning to Bethlehem, this place where the sacrificial lambs were to be raised, uh, it's the springtime of the year. And the reason the shepherds are out and they're abiding their flocks by night is because they don't know when the youths are are giving birth. And so they're, they're not in the pens because that could cause harm to the lambs with all the sheep. So so they were in the fields. And more often, 
and this is something I, I knew from our own sheep, was that the sheep like to go off and find a quiet area in even a hidden spot. Uh, they would find the corner of the stall and the horse's stall and hide in there and, and give their birth. And, and more often than not, if they could, they'd find a cave. Um, there were caves in those areas. And uh, as, as several uh, rabbis who understand the history and also who understand the scripture have implied is that unlike the Christian Christmas cards we share with each other, which kind of shows a, a little stable, a little lean-to next to the inn. Um, it wasn't that at all, that uh, Mary most likely had a cave, just like the animals, to bear the Messiah in. And there's reason for that, is because when this Lamb of God was born, what did she do? It says she wrapped them in swaddling clothes. You know what swaddling clothes are? I had to look this up. They're long strips of linen, almost the same if you've seen mummies and you know what they did. They wrap them up really tightly. It was sort of a custom in the day to do that with children, but the reason she wrapped them in swaddling clothes was because the shepherds did the same with the sacrificial sheep. They took swaddling clothes and wrapped them around the lamps so that they wouldn't be blemished or marred. She used the clothing that the shepherds had for the lambs to wrap the Messiah. Prophetic of who he was. And you think when all this was happening, here she's told she's going to give birth to the, the Messiah, that she's saying, oh, this is great. I'm in the cave. I'm, I'm using sheep's clothing to put on my baby. That's what God appointed. That's what he wanted. He came into the world in the most lowly manner, and he left in the most lowly manner, counted as a criminal, because that's what was appointed. It wasn't supposed to be that way in the minds of the people, but it was supposed to be that way to accomplish the purpose. It, there's more on that. Maybe in class we'll talk about that sometime. But this Messiah, our Savior, would be a sacrifice, and this Messiah or a sacrifice in that day could only be brought by a Jew. It could not be a Gentile. That's why they would say, hey, you can't offer sacrifices that were offered by you know, the pagans or, or different things. You, you have to bring this sacrifice to us. And so uh, in uh, Leviticus, the ruling priest at one time before this great Passover ceremony would take a goat and he would place both hands on the goat. And in that moment, pronounce all the sins of the nation at that time upon the head of this animal with his hands on it, transferring, and not pronouncing sins of the animal, but the sins of the people upon the animal, literally transferred. Leviticus 16, 21, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man to the wilderness. And see, so Pilate now, who is the Gentile ruler, washes his hands in front of these people and says, I'm not guilty of this. This is an innocent man. You see, the Gentiles did not bring the Messiah to the sacrifice and had no part of it. He gives him to Pilate, or gives him to Caiaphas, the rather the ruler, the chief priest. And what was the chief priest's job? To confer the sins by laying his hands upon the sacrifice. You see, at this point in time, Jesus has been taken, he's in the court. All of his disciples said, None of this is going our way, and they fled. They couldn't see what God had appointed. And now the chief priest lays his very hands on Jesus. And what happens is Matthew 26, uh, 66 says, Then the high priest rents his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, you've heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they spit in his face, verse 68, and buffeted him. And others smote him with the palms of their hands. 
And they called him the sin that they were guilty of. Blasphemy. They had God in their presence, in the flesh, and they did not know him. See, the sacrifice could only atone for the sins of the guilty if it wasn't guilty of that himself. He says, who, and they say, who are you? They said, you've already told them who I am. Peter wrote, who in his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. And John writes again, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, to be the sacrifice for our sins. You see, that was what it meant to love, no matter what else happened. So none of them could see that by the very worst things that happened, the very best things were about to happen. And so what did God want us to do in spite of that? He wanted us to appoint our days. He wanted us to live our days with purpose, not let the circumstances of our life define our days, but let the circumstances of our life and let our life define our circumstances so that we can be called the children of God. The Book of Mormon says it was appointed by God that man would die, but it also says it was appointed that he would live so that we could die so that we could live with him. Those words that Jonas spoke in the Hebrew, two words, uh, the Baruch and Atah, the Atah meant you, uh, and it was a you referring to God. And, and it, what the Hebrews taught was that every prayer should be about praising God, no matter your circumstance. It should not only begin with praise, but it, it meant more specifically the attitude of your life should reflect a praise of God. And it meant to God you, not God him, not God he, not God the one that was... the. God, you, first person, I'm talking to you. Lord, I want to bless you by being a blessing to other people. When you bless God in your circumstances, it makes you stronger. The Baruch Atah Adonai is your focus. You praise God by not letting your worries cloud your praise of him. If you put him first, if you put his will first, his desires first, his glory first, and make it the purpose of your life above everything else, you will bless him and you will appoint your days. And if you make your purpose to bless everyone else in your life, as these people who've lived through scripture have testified, we will prevail. We will prevail no matter what happens. We've just partaken of communion. All this is about the one who is intended to do us good, no matter the circumstances, no matter the circumstances. And I would ask you to consider something, and, and this could have been appropriate if I shared it before communion, but don't confuse our partaking with our own works. What do I mean by that? What do I mean? Where our sins were transferred to him on the cross, right? His, his forgiveness was granted before we ever asked. Our covenant with him is eternal, whether we remember it or not. Don't confuse communion with feeling like, I have to partake this to renew something. You renew your covenant with him every time you purpose to do good for someone. You renew your covenant with him every time you choose to love somebody. Right? The words renewing your covenant don't appear anywhere in scripture. They're, they're words we use, and it's okay. We understand what that means. 
But you, as the, as the scripture, as the prayer we read over the uh, uh, communion signifies, when we take his name upon us and ha have his spirit to be with us, he is empowering us to be his ambassadors, to go out and do good, to love, as John said, no matter what our circumstance. That's what's being symbolized when we partake. And that's what he asks you to do today, is to go forth. You could just close your eyes and touch someone next to you and find someone who you could pour your love into in a way that they need right now. And if you've taken this communion and felt his spirit, then go forth and do that. Because it's not about us. It's not about what happens to us. It's about him. And he gave us this promise. He gave us a promise in the book of Revelation at the end of the story, he says this. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And he and John was carried away into the, the spirit to a great mountain, and he was shown a great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending from God out of heaven. And he writes that, he said, every tear of every face was wiped away by the God who gave you life. Every hurt, every pain, every illness, every loss of loved one, every loss of a worldly possession, to be forgotten, to be made up for, to have its memory washed away and replaced by things of better worth, by him, the one who we remember today. We can't control the circumstances of this world. We can't even predict them. But we can choose to go forth in love and to serve and to be his people until he comes. Thank you. Our God said that he, uh, he makes all things new. And it is his intent and his purpose to transform you and to make you a new creature. We, um, we walk by faith in this world. And um, the beauty of our time together is that um, we can be reminded that um, we're not left alone in that walk. But our God has given patterns so that we might see that uh, he has prepared for us that which is to come. And we have promise. We have the promise of eternal life. We have the promise of forgiveness. A few weeks ago, our brother Aaron, he, uh, he spoke to us of that path that we walk, and he, um, he spoke about how sometimes we, um, we often build walls between us and our Savior. That our Savior, he walks with us no matter what is happening. But sometimes that we build walls between him and us. Let us this day choose our Heavenly Father. And he asks you, please, tear down that wall between me and you so that we might sup together, so that the blessings that I have for you might be more keenly felt within your life 
draw near unto me, so that I might draw near unto you. Seek me earnestly, so that you might find me. For I have so much to offer to each one of you. I know. I know your needs. And I have not left you alone. Nor will I leave you alone. And I have comforted you. And I will comfort you. Tear down the walls that you have created between me and you. It's pleasing to the Lord the way you have responded to the needs of your brothers and sisters. Continue to do so. Continue to show them the love that your Heavenly Father has placed within you so that you might be that blessing to them. We have that opportunity to serve each other at this time and this moment. There will be no offertory today. So if you have that to give today, you may place those in the baskets as you leave out in the back of the, the uh, entryway. We will conclude our worship today singing him 345. And we'll stand for that. Kind and beautiful Heavenly Father, we lift our hearts and voices unto you today in praise and thanksgiving. Thanking you, Father, for the blessings you have given us in our lives and praising you, Father, for the gift of your Son and uh, what he had done for us. I thank you, Father, this day for the Holy Spirit that we have been felt within this congregation and ask, Father, that you may continue to be with each and every one of us as we go about our daily lives that somehow, some way, Father, has, has been mentioned that uh, we may give thee thanks and we may be able to tear the wall down that uh, separates us and keeps us from you. I ask, Father, that you go with each and every one of us this, this day. It's my prayer in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.